everybody. Thanks for joining us for another discussion about what's new in healthcare. And in, in this episode, our focus is really on, uh, on GI, on the, the subspecialty of gastroenterology. And, and joining us today is uh, my colleague, Brett Bernstein, who's uh, an associate professor of medicine at the Icon School of Medicine, uh, our division chief here at Mount Sinai Beth Israel for GI and newly appointed as the medical director for GI services for the whole Mount Sinai healthcare system. Dr. Bernstein, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Matt. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's really, I mean, we get to spend a lot of time together talking about patients. So it's its really interesting to, to get to sit down and talk with you about some of these issues. And I know one of the ways we collaborate is on, on the C5, on the citywide colorectal cancer control coalition always takes me a minute to get that out right. and you know a couple of years ago we released new screening guidelines and now the the united states preventive services task force has released new screening guidelines and i wonder if you could sort of take us through those a little bit and what's what's different and what people need to know about them yeah so again thanks for inviting me and you know of course this is one of my passions and i know it's actually one of your passions which is yeah you know, trying to get as many people screened as possible. And, you know, of course, trying to get people from uh, lower socioeconomic background screened. But in terms of background, uh, you know, all of us know that colon cancer is the third most common cancer. It's the third most common cause of cancer death. It's estimated that about 100,000 new cases will occur probably this year. Um, and what's interesting is, well, we've done a really good job in terms of screening. Um, and in fact, colon cancer rates dropped about 1% per year between 2012 and 16. But what unfortunately happened was in that statistic, what was kind of missed is that there's been an increase in the incidence of colon cancer, unfortunately, among people younger than 50. Mm. And um, with noticing that. And uh, unfortunately, we don't exactly know what the reasons are behind that. There's a lot of hypotheses and theories, including changes in the microbiome, uh, sedentary lifestyles, maybe environmental uh, causes. Nobody's really sure. But in response to that, um, as you alluded to, the U.S. Preventative Task Force and the U.S. Multi-Society Task Force uh, looking at data, um, change the screening age from 50 to 45. And uh, of course, we all believe that that's going to make a very big difference, but that's the logic behind why this occurred. Right. And so when that's what we keep saying on the C5, that 45, that 50, 45 is the new 50, meaning that even if you have no symptoms, even if you have no family history, or I guess, especially if you have no symptoms and no family history, 45 is the right time to start screening. And obviously if you have, if you're high risk for other reasons, you should start screening even earlier. Yeah, and I think that's an important message to get across to the sort of non uh, healthcare oriented population is that what is screening? Screening means you're looking for something that's a relatively common disease in the absence of any symptoms. And uh, people often come to my office and they go, yeah, my, my primary doctor told me I have a colonoscopy, but I don't feel anything. Um, so I think people need to know, it, it's important to know, to, to, to define what screening is. Right, um, absolutely. And so the other thing I really like about the new guidelines is the focus, the early age is important, but also the sort of options for screening that you could do a colonoscopy or you can do a stool-based study. Um, you know, I see a lot of people who are scared, not of you, but are scared of going to the colonoscopist or getting a colonoscopy. Um, and so this gives them some options, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think that the key is, is that we certainly on the specialist side now, um, it's great that we have this other option, which, uh, which uh, is a stool-based test, uh, which many of you have probably seen ads for on TV, but ColoGuard, and this is a dramatic inroad because it can be done at home. Um, and it really tests for two different things uh, simultaneously. It tests for the presence of microscopic blood in the stool, but also it tests for some of the most common uh, DNA mutations, which occur both in 
uh, large polyps or colon cancers. So it's a non-invasive test that's 92% accurate for colon cancer. So it's a great option for people who are reluctant, may have other medical conditions that would make colonoscopy maybe a little more dangerous or difficult to do. Um, I mean, colonoscopy, of course, is still considered the gold standard, mainly because where tests like Cologuard fall short is in the detection of polyps. Right. And again, that's what makes colonoscopy the gold standard as a preventative exam is the ability to not only detect, but to remove precancerous polyps. Tests which are stool-based are considered early detection, but not preventative. Right. So you can actually prevent cancer by doing a colonoscopy. It's great for the people who can't or won't and are average risk. So they qualify for either test, you know, colon, Cologuard or another stool-based test. I think the mortality benefit is pretty similar, right? It is. It is. And there are ongoing large studies at places like Kaiser, which um, ultimately may turn out to show more of an equivalence possibly. You know, it's certainly in terms of re reduction in in death, but um, certainly right now in a um, a relatively healthy uh, forty five year old without other medical issues is going to have a long life if they're able to undergo a colonoscopy. That still remains the gold standard again because of its preventative nature. Right, and. Um... Cologuard, you know, if you do it, you have to remember to do it every three years. You have to remember to do our FIP test. You have to do every year. You have to remember that if it's positive, um, you need to go get a colonoscopy in a heart. Yes, correct. And uh, that brings up an important issue, which are what are called false positives. I mean, those of you who have seen the commercial, uh, of course, when they talk about uh, side effects or gaps in testing or drugs, they run through that very quickly. But there is a fairly significant false positive rate with Cologuard testing. And what that means is you could have a positive test, which then has to be followed up ideally with a colonoscopy. And in over 20% of cases, sometimes even a higher percentage, nothing wrong is going on. Um, so you, you may have that test and then end up being sub subjected to having a colonoscopy, but could turn out to be nothing. Absolutely. So, so let's suppose that we have this conversation and, and the patient agrees to go get a colonoscopy. What do I, as a primary care doctor, need to know about the colonoscopist? Like, how do I know who's good or not good or what the sort of risk factors are for making sure? Because obviously it's a very, you know, sort of user dependent exam, I guess, both on the patient and on the colonoscopist. Yeah, sure. And then that's a great point. Um, you know, it's like uh, lo looking up whether a restaurant is good and you can sort of rely a little bit on open table or Yelp. But, you know, knowing if your gastroenterologist is good is maybe a little bit more difficult than that. But we do have metrics and all of us now like to be data driven. And um, there is a metric um, or a measurement in terms of quality called the ADR. And ADR stands for adenoma detection rate. And adenomas represent the most common form of precancerous polyps. And pre means no cancer, but it does mean that they are of the variety that if they were left inside the colon and not removed, that they could or would turn into cancer. And it's been proven that those doctors who remove more of these adenomas are helping their patients in that they have a lower or reduced chance of developing colon cancer or even dying of colon cancer. Interesting. And so what, I mean, is that something I should just look up on, on the doctors I refer to? How can patients access those data? Right. So that's the problem. It's, it's not unfortunately standardized yet that this is data that's easily accessible. I, I can say that what we do um, at our ambulatory center and here at our hospital unit is that we actually tabulate that data. We participate in a national registry for uh, quality data. 
called GI Quick. Mm -hmm. um, and we essentially uh, give our doctors report cards actually um, every three, three months. So they're able to know where they stand both in relation to their peers and in relation to national benchmarks. And so what do you tell somebody whose ADR is low? Is it, I mean, what can they do to sort of improve their rates? So uh, there, there are easily accessible educational materials uh, which our GI societies uh, pr pr produce. And we, we actually have an educational program uh, that we require for those doctors who are under the benchmark, which consists of several videos uh, where they're able to learn better technique, how to maybe recognize uh, small polyps, that they might otherwise not have seen. Um, and we have seen that that has actually helped to improve um, many doctors' adenoma detection rates. Got it. Are there other things that are predictive? Like, um, you know, do you want to see a colonoscopist who does a certain number a year or something? Or does it matter if it's, a, you know, there are gastroenterologists who do colonoscopies. There are also, I guess, some colorectal surgeons who do them. I'm like, there, are there other factors that people should look for? Are they related to a academic medical center? Like, what are, the, what are the other things that people should think about? Well, in general, you know, board certification, just like you as an internist or a board certified, the American Board of Internal Medicine um, looking for a certified doctor means they've gone through rigorous training, passed rigorous exams, and have uh, gone through a fellowship, or which means a, um, excess training um, associated with performing many of these uh, many of these procedures. And you can access whether your physician is board certified just by going on to the American Board of Internal Medicine website. So certainly that's something you'd want to do. Got it. So the other question that comes up a lot is patients sometimes get the choice or sometimes are driven by insurance reasons or other reasons um, to either have their endoscopy in like a hospital setting or in an ambulatory endoscopy centers. Um, can you give us a little background on, on the difference and what the experience is like and, and what people should opt for if they're given a choice? Yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, again, it's generally at the discretion of the physician based on um, a patient's individual situation in terms of whether they have other concurrent medical issues. Uh, but in general, ambulatory surgery centers, which are freestanding centers that meet um, the same criteria at this point as uh, hospital endoscopy units, meaning they're accredited by the same bodies. Uh, one of which is the joint uh, of the joint commission. And what accreditation means is that there are rigorous standards that have to be met with respect to infection control, uh, patient safety. Um, again, the quality of the physicians and the staff is monitored on a free, free, free frequent basis. Um, the advantages of ambulatory surgery centers at this point in time are they do generally offer an equivalent experience, but at a lower cost. And that means at a lower cost, both to the patient um, and overall to the to society, potentially. Um, with the lowering of the age to, to 45, the number of people who are going to be entering the healthcare system who need to be screened is enormous. And we need to do what we can to find the best safest and lowest cost place for these procedures to be done. Yeah. And a lot of patients seem to like the experience because, you know, instead of having to win their way through the whole hospital or whatever, you know, they get in your case, they get in the elevator, they go downstairs and they're, um, you know, right there. And it's a streamlined organization that really their goal is to get everybody a colonoscopy and get them home. Yeah, I mean, exactly. Uh, for instance, our center, that's really all we do. So we truly are experts in all aspects of what goes into doing these procedures. So uh, we, again, monitor the skill and quality of the physicians. Uh, our technicians are all certified. We have state-of-the-art equipment. Um, and there's a tremendous focus on the patient experience. That's great. Now, I know... We talked a little bit about some of the changes in terms of uh, the new guidelines, 
but you had mentioned to me before about some of the changes coming uh, coming along in in the way of like artificial intelligence and stuff, ways to improve detection and diagnosis. Tell me, Sorry. tell me more about Sorry. that. Yep. Um, you know, artificial intelligence is really kind of a, a buzzword for a lot a lot of people, but there are a lot of evolving practical applications, and in the last set, several years, um, there are actually a have been already several products introduced to, to the market, which allow for um, CAD, which is stands for computer aided detection of polyps. Mm. And essentially what this involves is using um, computers which have mathematical algorithms that are actually real time attached to the processors that we use when we're doing a, a colonoscopy. And these computer programs actually will put a visible box around what it believes to be a polyp. Um, it's at the discretion of the doctor to determine if it really is a polyp. Hmm. But recent studies have actually shown significant improvements in the detection of small adenomas. So again, adenomas are those precancerous polyps, and um, which is very exciting because again, there are always a percentage of doctors who fall below the benchmark. So this will ultimately, we think, provide the opportunity to improve detection and ultimately therefore um, reduce colon cancer death because we know that for every 1% that a doctor's adenoma detection rate goes up, that the risk of pa their patients getting colon cancer goes down by 3%. Uh. And the mortality, meaning the chance of their patients dying from colon cancer goes down 5%. So if something like this can actually help to raise an individual doctor's ADR by even 1% or more, that's, uh, that's just a tremendous uh, innovation. That's fascinating. So maybe as people are looking to try to assess the ADR or assess the, um, the board certification, all those other things you talked about, maybe trying to figure out whether artificial intelligence is being used could be another, another marker of a place they want to go. How close is this to like being ready for prime time? So uh, again, there, there is one product out to market. Um, I think the jury, I would say, however, is out as to what the ultimate impact will be, in fact, on you know, colon cancer uh, incidence reduction and colon cancer death reduction. But I only see upside to it. I'd be hesitant to say it's completely ready for prime time. And one of the sort of limiting steps, uh, like with everything, is cost. Um, so until this gets to the point that it's easily accessible to every board-certified gastroenterologist, we wouldn't want to inadvertently create what could be a perceived two-tier system. Got it. All right. Duly noted. Well, excellent. Well, thank you so much. It looks like, uh, you know, a lot of stuff that, that's come up in the last couple of years, a lot of things to look forward to in the future. And the big message is make sure that people get screened, either because they have symptoms or a high family risk, in which case they should get, they should get screened early or at the very least by age 45 using one of the acceptable methods. Yeah, absolutely. That's not like a right, uh, right message to end on. I think so. And uh, again, I really appreciate you inviting me. And uh, again, we all need to get the message out is, you know, screening is important and whatever test that you're comfortable with is the right test. Sounds like a great way to end. Dr. Bernstein, thank you so much. Thanks everybody for joining us. Thank you.